Thank you for joining the third uh, rental roundtable. We've got Josh Nickel on today. Uh, talk about five shifts in the equipment rental industry that he sees and excited to, to, to dive in. I've known Josh for two and a half years, really, from day zero, starting quickly. We've had a lot of conversations about what's happening in the rental industry. So excited to dive in today. So in terms of housekeeping, um, feel free to chat in any questions at any time. Um, I'll either ask this to Josh or he'll see him and, and can answer them as we go. So this would be pretty interactive. The goal is to have a conversation. And I'll, I've got a lot of questions to ask Josh, but I think this would be uh, something the audience can participate in as well. If you've seen other episodes, that's sort of how things have gone. So with that being said, Josh, I'd love to hear about your background just for everyone uh, who doesn't know you about how you got into the rental industry and, and what you're up to now. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for the introduction. And and I agree, like nothing's really off limits. I mean, I guess we can't talk price, um, but really <laughs> anything other than that, we're, we're ready to go. Um, so for me, uh, my grandfather was an equipment rental. My dad was an equipment rental. I swore I was not going to be an equipment rental, yet here I am. Uh, it turns out it's a pretty good place to be. Uh, I owned my own equipment rental company in Atlanta, Georgia for a number of years. Uh, we were listed by Inc. Magazine as one of the fastest growing independent companies for four years in a row. And then we were acquired by Sunbelt Rentals in 2018. Spent a little bit of time with them before moving overseas and running the global operations for Point of Rental out of London. Um, and then moved back to the States in 2020, had been a volunteer for the association for most of my life. And then they offered for me to, to actually be on staff here uh, and represent equipment rental companies. So I represent our roughly 4,500 equipment rental companies with everything from advocacy to certifications and education, um, industry awareness and workforce. Um, so it's, it's a lot of fun to be an ambassador for the industry. Awesome. Well, thanks for that, Josh. I'd love to just go ahead and jump in here to the, the first topic. Um, just it's high level, general shifts happening in the rental industry. You think about this every day. You talk to members every day. So if anyone's well situated to talk about it, it's you. So um, love to hear about how you're seeing things change generally in, in the rental market. Yeah. I mean, if you know me, you know, I'm probably an enthusiastic person. Um, so, um, you know, I know that I have that bias, but there are just so many great tailwinds to be excited about in the uh, equipment rental industry as a whole. It's it's a great time to be in rental. And, and when you talk about general shifts, one of the things that I then think of is generational shifts. You know, the, the people who are moving on to the contractor job site in leadership roles, project manager roles, general contractor roles, they grew up with Airbnb. They grew up with Uber. Um, they get the idea of the sharing economy, access versus ownership. You know, the U.S. has always been an ownership economy. We want to own our house. We want to own our boat. We want to own our car. And we want to own our excavator. Um, but that's really starting to shift beyond any other kind of supports that we may talk about today. Some of it's just that mindset of younger people coming into that role who are comfortable with that idea. Who are like, you know what? I'm a great plumber. I'm a great electrician. That's what I love to do. I'm not necessarily a fleet manager. I don't want to deal with all of that hassle. I want an excavator when I need an excavator. And I want any size excavator when I need an excavator. Just like when I go to order an Uber, you know, today I might want an SUV and tomorrow I might just want a small car or a ride share or something. Um, so those people get that. And I think that's really influencing their buying behavior. And, and I think one of the other things that we might get into is where they want to do business a little bit as well. But I'll pause there for, for a second. Yeah. And do you think just as younger generations get more comfortable with sharing, um, how, I mean, how do you see that playing out in the rental industry? Does that mean more demand? Does that ultimately mean more rental companies? Like what is, how does that play out to the rental company's bottom line ultimately? It's probably a little bit of both. Um, you know, one of the things that's really impressed me about the industry is when I joined the association, we have still been growing on the equipment rental side every year. We're at record numbers of both branch members and company members. So it's an industry that is really still adding people despite the barriers to entry, despite the complexity. So there's still space there. Um, but I think at the end of the day, what it really increases is rental penetration or the percentage of equipment on a construction job site or in a warehouse that's rented versus owned. You know, that continues to go up and up. You know, there's a lot of places in the world like in Europe where rental penetration is much higher than it is here. And there are certainly some categories that I think are getting close to maybe their max penetration, something like a access and aerial and big downtown areas, you know, a huge amount of that is rented. So maybe there's not as much opportunity in something like that. Not that there's not still opportunity, but 
general rents, specialty, DIY, all of that, you know, there's just still so much more room for contractors to rent more. And, and for what we see over time, once a contractor gets comfortable renting, they don't really go back. Anytime there's a major shock to the system, you see an immediate and harsh pullback in rental penetration. But that's because they don't need as much equipment. So they return the owned equipment. They're not immediately going to sell the fleet that they have. But once they go back and they sell that fleet and they get used to renting to then increase their business again, as business starts to pick back up, they don't really go backwards in the same way. Um, so I think you're going to continue to see that trend. It's just kind of pushed along a little bit more by the people who are, are now making those decisions, those rent versus buy decisions, being much more comfortable with that idea. You mentioned penetration on a job site, the difference between rent versus owned. Where do you see, you know, I think the last numbers we've talked about, potentially another double, year of double digit growth for the rental industry. Where's that growth coming from? Is it from increased penetration on job sites? Is it from new, ultimately just new construction happening? Is it from uh, other areas like, you know, Rental industry has done well, it's continued to grow. Like where particularly has that growth come from? Yeah, certainly rental penetration is increasing. 2020, there was a shock. So yeah, the, uh, the penetration went down significantly. Um, so that's coming back up to more normal levels. The supply chain has really impacted things. Um, but, you know, we expect rental penetration to continue to increase in the same way, you know, just as, as more people get used to it. And then, and certainly in some areas like specialty, it's really, really low penetration right now. And so there's really nowhere to go, but up when you think of like that Amazon warehouse that has forklifts that they've always bought or leased rental makes sense. When you think about uh, the floor scrubbers that they have to use, there's a lot of things like that that rental makes sense where we have incredibly low penetration. And I think that things will continue to accelerate in those areas. And, you know, even when we talk about the growth we expect for the industry, you know, I think that in some cases it's, we're under reporting a little bit. When I talk to members, when we survey members directly, we're seeing members have record years, you know, and huge increases. You know, when you talk about macroeconomic um, national models for um, trying to understand where an industry is going like this, it's, you know, it's, it's easy when things are stable or growing normally, but it's hard when you have these weird shocks to the system um, and weird impacts, maybe even black swan events. And so I think that we're really underestimating on some level. And one of the things that I was reading about, um, I guess it was just in the last week, is that um, the government may be revising up its um, non-residential construction numbers quite significantly. Um, and that also is a big part of our model. So that might be one of the reasons why our model has been, I would say, lagging a little bit in the last couple of years. I'd rather set expectations lower than they are, but I think expectations for a lot of rental companies has been a fair amount better than, than what we could really predict. Yeah, it sounds like you guys feel like you're underestimating what's actually happening in rental. There's growth on the table that you're not seeing is what it sounds like where you're getting at, which ultimately is good for folks in the rental industry, right? So we've Absolutely. seen growth, but it actually could be higher than what, what the numbers are. Yeah, it's definitely higher in specialty, which is harder to track. Um, and then I think it's higher based on anecdotal evidence and some survey evidence on the other side. You know, and, and some of that's just held back also by um, availability of equipment, which is starting to slightly get better and availability of people. You know, our average member is understaffed by 30%. If they could get the people they needed or the fleet that they needed, I'll bet that would increase even more. Yeah, so I, I want to dive into that. Um, it's not necessarily a topic we have here, but just on the people and labor side, like we, we talked about this even before we got on, like what, what are you seeing around just labor shortages and how is that impacting rental companies? Yeah, it's a problem that's existed for a while. You know, this isn't a post-2020 labor shortage thing. It's a generational issue. Uh, the whole construction industry has a hard time. The manufacturing industry has a hard time. It's hard to find skilled labor. It's, it, it's lacking cachet to go into the trades. Even though the trades are great career, career paths now, they pay really well. You know, there's all these incentives to go to college. You know, you want to go to college and be a doctor or a lawyer or a programmer or something like that. You know, th that's what career counselors talk about. They don't talk about the equipment rental industry and they don't really talk about construction in the same way. You know, so there's a, you know, a short term issue of awareness of the equipment rental industry and then a longer term issue of attracting more people to the trades and to careers where they get to work with their hands and be outside and do things that are really interesting to a large swath of people. They're just not encouraged. And so like we were at an event um, on the mall where we took over the, the mall in D.C. with construction equipment to talk to students and educators and legislators because 
we want legislators to give as much support and encouragement to going to trade school and getting your diesel mechanic certification as they go to get your doctorate or anything else that they do. You know, let the student find the path that they want to find and the career enjoyment and passion that they have. Don't just point them in, in one direction. And then we're trying to hit it from a bunch of different angles. You know, we're going to uh, the Girl Scouts triannual, I think it's Jamboree next <laughs> month, which I think is going to be awesome. You know, we've got a partnership with Girl Scouts. You think about Girl Scouts, they're, they're, they're women who want to be outside, who want to work with their hands. I mean, they're, they're perfect targets for our industry and being able to talk to them about different career paths, I think is awesome. I, I remember we did a women in construction uh, event uh, a number of years ago, and I was just uh, in an office with somebody and, and talking to the front desk person. And she was like, you know, I really appreciate what you guys are doing in the space because, you know, when I think about it, when I was younger, I love working with my hands. I love being outside. And I didn't know career paths like that were for me or were available for me, you know? So we're really trying to tackle it from as many different perspectives as we can. So we're playing a little bit of the short game, uh, but also really trying to play the long game, which is going to be, you know, critical over time because it's, it's not going to be fixed just by industry awareness. Yeah, when I and I talked to a lot of rental companies, you know, the biggest some of the biggest challenges we hear, obviously, what you hear as well, sh equipment shortages and then people shortages. Um, I know a lot of the members are happy to hear about the work you guys are doing on on the people side. Do you have any advice for the? You know, we have a lot of rental operators, rental owners on the call. Um, any advice for them in terms of sourcing and finding talented people? Given yes, ARA is doing all these things, pushing things forward. You've been a rental business mm -hmm. owner operator yourself. I'm curious if you talk to other members. Have you found found any channels or any sort of sourcing, uh, I guess, strategies that have worked or finding really talented people who work in the rental industry? I, I think it takes some creativity. You can't just show up. Um, so we have seen a, a lot of people have success with um, underserved markets or underserved groups. Um, you think about people with some disabilities or people who are um, what they call re-entering um, the the job market after being incarcerated or something like that. You know, we've, you know, one one of my uh, some of my best employees had a felony on their record, um, and you know they were different people back when that happened, and they were amazing employees. And so, you know, I think being open minded to to who you're getting, um, and then treating them amazingly. You know, it not every rental company is understaffed by thirty percent. There are a number of rental companies that I talk to who are fully staffed and have been fully staffed, but they have amazing work cultures. They really take their time on hiring. They really take care of their people. Um, you know, I wouldn't say that they're like Google where they have ping pong tables and stuff like that, but they do that kind of thing for the equipment rental people. You know, so they're having grill outs with steaks. They're doing things that their type of employee would really enjoy and be interested in building a culture around what matters to those folks. Um, I know one of the things that, that we did when we were trying to hire people is we actually gave them a sales packet. Um, you know, you, you don't normally think about wanting to try and sell an employee when they ask for an application or a potential employee, but we did. We wanted to really excite that person. Um, you know, so when somebody came and asked for an application, we'd give them a whole packet of things that had articles about us. It had a letter from me. It had stuff about our core values. It, it talked about how it was a hard place to get a job. And honestly, when we first started saying that, it wasn't true. Um, but as we kept doing that, it became true and it became selective. And what I wanted to do was either kind of freak people out and be like, you know what, this nickel rental place, these people are a little bit weird. I don't want to work there. Or like, wow, this is amazing. This is the kind of places I've been looking for. You know, I grew up on the farm working on my uh, grandfather's tractor and it was such a great time. I love working with my hands and these people get that and these people are doing that and I have the opportunity to do these different things. And, you know, one of the things that I think we miss in equipment rental is there are certain types of mechanics and drivers and even salespeople who like what we do better than their other options by far. You know, you think about if you want to be a driver, do you really want to be a long haul trucker or do you want to be getting in and out of your truck, talking to people, doing things? If you're that kind of driver, equipment rental is great for you. You know, if you're a mechanic who wants to do the exact same thing every day, just change oil, rotate tires or work on a manufacturing line, you know, that's great. Go do that. But if you're the kind of mechanic who's creative, who wants to do something different today than you did yesterday, you want to smell the exhaust, taste the oil, feel the vibration, figure something out that's new and different, you're an equipment rental mechanic. 
And so if you can kind of find those people and cultivate those people, engage those people for the long term, you know, it's huge. Um, there, there was a survey that I read a couple of years ago that said, um, you know, most employees are, are disengaged and they perform at 70 percent of their potential. So if you think about that metric of uh, our members being 30 percent understaffed, if they were engaged and performing at 100 percent of potential, you wouldn't be understaffed. Um, so I think there's a lot in both the hiring, certainly, yes. but also in the back end. Um, that's really important. Yeah, I think I think it's a key piece is um, is the retention aspect, right? A lot of people talk about hiring, 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 but retention is maybe even more important. I mean, I, I read articles that the cost to replace someone is like 15 times their salary, given all the turnover, the train. It's crazy. Whatever the number is, it's, it's mm -hmm. crazy. Um, we do have one question from the audience. Um, does the ARA offer any resources on helping? rental businesses find employees. So this is maybe putting your ARA hat on. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I'm trying to see if I can pull it up on our website and put that in the chat for you while I tell you about it. Um, and it looks like I can, even though I'm usually terrible about doing two things at once. So I'm putting in the chat for everybody, a link to our workforce page. Um, so there's a ton of things that we both do for you um, and that uh, we can do with you. So we go to workforce events in person at trade schools, all across the country. We're working on uh, certifications that trade schools can offer for the construction equipment industry. Um, we have uh, a lot of things that we're doing with counselors to try and increase awareness of jobs in the industry. And we've got an actual whole workforce page that we send people to. Um, but in addition to that, we, on that page, you can find some other support, some things like best practices in hiring. We've got job descriptions. We've got something called the ARA job portal. It's, we call it a portal because it's beyond a job board. You know, a job board is just where you place stuff and where people go to. Um, and then that's the end of it. You know, one, but one of the things that we found for our members is it's hard to be in all the right places. You know, there's a lot of niche job boards like military.com that might be prohibitive for a small business to find and make sure their job's posted on. So for the job portal, when you post it on there, it actually goes out to hundreds of different job sites like military.com, disabilityjobs.com, different things like that that you might not find. So it's kind of a performance multiplier for you. And in fact, most of our largest companies use it because it's a better return on investment for them to do it through that than others. And the other thing that's nice about that one is you have to have some kind of centralized place to send people. When we're, we're talking to career advisors and counselors and parents and Girl Scouts, you know, we have to send them to one place. We can't send them directly to your rental store. Um, but once we send them to that place, that's a good place for them to find you. And that is its own website called arayrentalworks.com. And I will put that also in the chat for you here. And so this is our um, workforce facing site. So it's not for you, the rental company. This is for um, people that we're trying to convince to come into the industry or stay in the industry. The other thing that I would say about the job portal and certifications is we want people to stay in the industry once they're here yeah. and have career portability. So if you're at a rental store in Atlanta and you need to move to Seattle for whatever reason, we don't want you to get out of the rental industry. So we need to have a place where you can go and say, hey, I want another local rental store in Seattle that I can find. And in addition to that, we launched some certifications last year that show career progression. People want to move up in their career. So we've got uh, certifications, which are true, like near college course certifications for sales and marketing and rental and um, service technician. They're like 40 hours worth of coursework. They're designed by rental stores for rental stores with rental store stuff in it that's really specific to what you need and do. But it gives them that career progression where they feel like they can move up and that certification stays with them, just like another certification, like a Honda engine certification that you would get. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, thanks for sharing the links. We've got those here for everyone. Um, Josh, I want to move to one of our next topics, which is around the macroeconomic landscape. We can sort of combine this with topic three here around interest rates. But uh, you know, a lot of the a lot of the buzzword this year is uh, uncertainty, and uncertainty in interest rates, uncertainty the Fed's going to do with the macro economy. Are we in a recession? What's going on with inflation? Lots of talk, right? As you well know. Love to hear your perspective on, obviously you don't have a crystal ball, but like as a rental company, uh, how should they be thinking about that and, and navigating this really uncertain time we're in? Yeah. I mean, I mean, I think that you always want to be cautiously optimistic. You know, one of the lessons I personally learned the hard way 
in 2008 and 2009 is you can do the right things and screw it all up. You know, it is okay to miss rentals. If you have enough inventory that you never miss a rental, you probably have too much inventory. You can grow too quickly. We had to close a location in 2009 because we opened it up like business was going to be booming immediately. And it was too much too fast. So, you know, I, I want to counter my bias for enthusiasm with, you know, you can go too far too fast and you have to be careful with that. That being said, most recessions are not like 2008, 2009. You know, that was a depression in the construction industry. Construction companies were going out of business. Equipment was getting liquidated. In a normal uh, recessionary period, it's actually good for rental. The rental is counter-cyclical. When you think about putting yourself in the contractor's shoes, when business is great, I've got a long book of business. I know what I'm going to be doing for the next six to 12 months. Cash is, is great, you know, and I have to go make that decision. Well, do I... Do I want to invest in a piece of equipment and buy it, especially if interest rates are low, my, my uh, confidence level is high, I get free money, why not, right? Versus renting something, because now I feel like I might maybe be investing in something. But when there's uncertainty, and as a contractor, I'm like, you know, things are okay right now, but what are they going to be like in six months or 12 months? And interest rates are higher, so I'm not getting that free money. It makes it harder for me to make that buying decision. And, you know, as we discussed before, once they get comfortable with rental, once they see the ease and efficiency and effectiveness of it, they tend to stick more with it. So really, especially if these are kind of like soft uncertainties, um, you know, we definitely don't want the bottom to fall out of anything. But if it's just a little uncomfortable, if interest rates are a little bit high, you know, those types of things, that's actually really great times um, to establish great relationships with contractors so that when things get great again, they're not out there buying all the equipment. Interesting. I think we've talked about this previously, but with um, more uncertainty in the market, contractors are less likely to big, make big capital purchases, right? Less likely to buy, more likely to rent. Where you're saying actually in these times, it actually is beneficial for rental companies to take advantage of. Is that, is that an accurate statement? Absolutely. This is the time where you can really change contractor perspective and at least even in your own market, increase rental penetration so that um, the industry keeps growing. And there's a, a lot of opportunity to do that. Um, I'd love to go back to 2008, 2009, like thinking about when you're you know, running a rental business, the bottom did fall out. Curious on lessons learned, right? You know, I, I hope we don't get there, but yep. we don't have a crystal ball. I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic too. I see your Ted Lasso believe sign. I used to have one myself. So I'm, I'm also just an eternal optimist, but You've, you've lived through the tough times. You've gotten to the other side. Like going back, you go back to 2007, 2008. What did you feel like you guys did well? What would you do differently? Just to have people in people's mm. minds say, navigate whatever we're going to be going through. Hopefully it's not that scenario, but you've lived through it. I'd love to hear your perspective on that. Yeah, I think, I mean, for me back in that time, I was, you know, 28, 29, and I was cocky. Um, honestly, I, I was overconfident. And um, everything that we were doing was working really well and it felt like rinse and repeat. And so I, I, and for my own self, I think it was a learning experience of just, you know, checking some of that bias for enthusiasm. Um, you know, it's just like with the stock market, people want to buy the stock market when the stock market's going up, not when it's going down. You know, that's the way you kind of feel you, you go into that space, you know, 2006 and seven were great years for us. And so it just made sense to go all in on a new location in 2008. And it was a terrible time to go all in, you know, you always want to give yourself some of those outs. But I think the other thing that we learned is to be a little bit more careful with our purchasing decisions and our buying decisions and a little bit more, I would say data driven and analytical you know, before we did a lot off of just gut feel and a lot of uh, rental companies do this. They, you know, they look out at their lot and that's how they make their buying and selling decisions and pricing decisions and all of those kinds of things. We weren't using data to do that. We were using gut feeling and experience, which isn't replicatable, isn't scalable and is driven by emotion. You know, so one of the things that we did was um, really started tracking how we do missed rentals. Uh, we tracked who the miss rental was to, what the piece of equipment was, how long the miss rental was for, what the date was, and then how much revenue that would have generated. And without going into too much detail today, it allowed us to actually create some spreadsheets where managers could just go in there or salespeople could go in there and put all this data in. And then it would automatically red flag or green flag an acquisition of, of new fleet for them. If it 
hit the right qualification, if we knew we could get the right return on investment with that piece of equipment at that size category and those dates and all that kind of stuff on an annualized basis, there was no question. We're going to go buy that piece of equipment for you. You've proven it. Um, but if it's you know log splitters in the first cold weekend in fall and every log splitter goes out and you miss 20 rentals for one day, don't buy more log splitters. You know, And that's an oversimplified example. Um, but that's the way we feel. We feel like in Georgia, at least, after it's been raining for a few weeks, that first week after the rain, every track loader in Georgia goes out. So if you go buy a bunch more track loaders, you're probably going to shoot yourself in the foot if you're not careful. Um, and so it's really starting to follow a little bit more of the data. Not that you wouldn't still use experience and your gut, because I think those intuition, especially if you have enough experience, is really valuable and important. But you also pair that or you check yourself with the data, kind of like we do with Renalytics. You know, does the industry expect to grow next year? If you're expecting to grow, you hope it is. If it if the industry is expected to shrink next year and you think you're going to grow, just it may be true, but just check yourself before you do that. And if anybody would like to um, either chat about or have a copy of the uh, how we did Miss Reynolds, the Excel, sp Excel spreadsheet we used for that, I'd be happy to provide that uh, one off to anybody who's interested. Yeah, that's awesome. Sounds like the biggest thing was what you learned through that period was just getting tighter on some of the analytics piece. And the number one metric to simplify things was Miss Reynolds and tracking that and using that to make future purchasing decisions, which yeah. um, they're expensive decisions, right? You don't want to mess those up. And I think using data to drive that uh, is probably the right thing. I mean, um, you think about it. And the, the other thing that I would have is that rental is a cash flow business. It's incredibly capital intensive. Um, so having the right partners, whether it be a bank, private equity, um, local people, family, anything like that, so that you have the cash reserves when you're trying to grow, you know, don't, you don't have to ride the razor's edge of it. You know, you want to make sure that you have some downside protection. So making sure that your cash flow is strong and that your balance sheet is strong as you're making those decisions is important. Do you have any advice in thinking about that trade off? So we've talked to other groups about that is thinking about when do you bring on investors to be more aggressive? We've talked to groups who bootstrap it and they've done it their whole way th themselves. We've also talked to groups who take it on um, investor partners pretty early on in the journey. Do you have any thoughts on that? I don't know what path you guys took at, at Nickel Rental, but I'm curious how you think about the trade-off between bootstrapping and taking on investors to grow uh, more quickly. You know, it, it's always a risk reward and it depends on what your risk tolerance is. You know, one of the things that I learned through 2008 and 2009, and even then later on, is your banker might be nice, but they really don't care. You know, they just want you to make your payment. They don't really want to see you grow. They want to collect those interest payments. Um, they're not there to support you and particularly to help you grow. Um, so finding either peers or partners that help you with that is valuable. Timing is also critical though. Like you wouldn't necessarily want to start a rental company, bring it up to $100,000 a year in revenues, and then go out and try and find private equity. Um, or venture capital or something like that, because it, the timing's just not right. There's certain thresholds that are important to hit to be attractive to those and, and for yourself. Um, you know, I, I've talked to a number of people lately, for example, who are, you know, my age, maybe even a little bit younger, who are still excited about growing, but they're ready to take some chips off the table or ready to de-risk a little bit um, or want partners. You know, when we were acquired by Sunbelt, we were actually in the process of looking for private equity and we just ended up getting strategically acquired. But one of the things that I had decided and, and my team had decided along with me was that we wanted to continue to grow. We could have just continued to be profitable and not grow, but that sounded boring to our team. So we wanted to continue to grow, but we didn't want to keep doing it on essentially at the time, my parents' retirement. Um, because all of their money was invested in that. We needed a way to cash them out. And I really wanted help. You know, we had a great leadership team and was excited about the idea of essentially getting a board of directors, a group of people who were invested in us and also invested in our growth, who were going to push us. And I know there's some fear from some people of lack of control or what if they fire me? But, you know, at the end of the day, if I'm not the right person for the job, even if it's my company and I own it, I probably shouldn't be doing that job because I'm going to run my own company into the ground. Um, so, you know, from my personal perspective, and this is all very personal, um, you know, I was ready to take that leap. My leadership team wanted to take that leap and, and bring on partners to help us drive in a different way. And again, we got strategically acquired instead, and, and most of my team is still there and very happy there as well. Um, so all of those things are opportunities, but it's, it's about timing, risk tolerance, cash flow, 
um, you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. You've, you've had quite the experience going through the recession, running the family business, selling the family business. Um, a lot of, a lot of experience for the group here. Got a question from, I got a couple questions, actually one from Desmond, Josh, have you started to see the impact of the infrastructure bill on equipment rental? How should rental companies prepare for the upcoming demand? Um, you know, I, I, I don't say, I don't think that we've really seen much impact. Some of that stuff takes so long to trickle through. And usually it starts with the big site contractors and some of that. So maybe some of our largest members are starting to see some of it. You know, there's also a lot of what, what they would call mega projects uh, that are coming online for Meta and Google and some of these other giant things that are, I think, going to be really interesting and um, really distracting. You know, I know for myself as a smaller rental company, I didn't go after, I mean, mega projects wouldn't even be on my radar. I didn't even go after large plants, you know? So I think that does give some opportunity to some small, small and mid-sized companies because while some of the national companies are going to be very focused on really big infrastructure, um, maybe specialty and these mega projects, that might open the door for you to focus on landscapers, small and mid-sized contractors, local contractors. You know, one of the things that, that I did see and we do see when things slow down is that, you know, the, the focus on different size customers changes. If you think about it, if you're in a market and you've got three rental companies and one rental company focuses on the large contractors in the area, if the large contractors aren't doing as much business, but they still have just as much equipment to rent, they're going to start going down market to small and mid-sized contractors. Um, so I think that the infrastructure long-term and these mega projects long-term will just continue to open up opportunity for small and mid-sized rental companies. Yeah, and I think you mentioned earlier around like general tool being more competitive, potentially more highly utilized, but specialty as a potential niches to, um, I guess you can dominate more, more attractive. Do you see that as well? Like, is that something here? Like rental is not, you know, it's a broad term. Everything under the sun can be rental. But when you talk about equipment rental in particular, there's different sub segments. Yeah. For the, for the groups on the, on the call who are thinking about where to invest uh, my resources and, and, and equipment. How do you think about that around just general equipment investment versus moving more towards some of the specialty tools? I think you've got to know your contractor base really well, and you've got to know your local markets really well. Um, you know, if you were to go try and get into, let's say, specialty power um, and generators or something like that, to really get into the market, um, you have to invest differently. In fact, I'll give an example here locally. So I live across the street from the uh, largest movie studio on the East Coast that does all the Marvel, Marvel movies. Um, I think you were on one of the Marvel movies, weren't you? I, I was not, but my my daughters actually met some of the, the folks over in them, which was pretty neat. Yeah. Um, but, you know, when you talk to those people, um, there's a, an amazing opportunity for production rental, especially right in this area. But when I talk to the contractors that work there and I, and I look at the local rental companies, they can't just go use a local rental company because they need specialty quiet generators. They need um, reach lifts, man lifts, and boom lifts that are painted black. So they're easier to take out of uh, the background in a movie shot. They need 24 seven service because it costs 200 to $300,000 an hour to shut down a movie. Yeah. Um, and they need plenty of fleet. Like you don't say no to a production company. Um, one time during the, the middle of a drought, we were working with a production com company and they just wanted to make a runway wet for a, a vodka commercial because I guess they look better when they're wet. And um, it was the middle of a drought. You couldn't get a water truck anywhere and they needed it. So they paid us a couple thousand dollars to have a rollback truck with a bunch of big water tanks some three quarter inch pumps and some generators and guys on back going like this to wet the runway. You just say yes and you find out a way to make it happen. So specialty is tough because you can't just toe into it very easily unless you have zero competition. We were lucky then because production was new in Atlanta. And so we could toe into it a little bit, but then quickly got supplanted by people who focus on the market. So I think it's knowing your customer base and do you have the opportunity? And then it does take a little bit of a leap. When you look at a lot of specialty, whether it's at the large rental companies or rental companies that focus on that, it's almost a different division. It's it's not quite as different probably as event rental is to equipment rental, but it's a different customer base. It's a different sales process. It's a different fleet stock and stuff like that. When you talk about HVAC and flooring solutions, you can't just store that with your tillers and your aerators because they can't get dirty. 
Um, so I think it's it's making a conscious decision to go in on specialty and and rather than just say, well, you know, we'll carry some extra generators, some extra pumps. Doesn't mean don't be opportunistic, but to really do it, you've got to go into it. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I got another question from the audience. Just a reminder, folks, you can feel free to just chat, continue chatting questions. We'll get to them. Um, this one is going back to what you were mentioning around um, what using data to buy equipment. So what are the main data points to look at to tell if it's a good time to buy more equipment? And maybe if I had my own question to that, also when to sell, right? Because that's another piece here that- uh, Oh, yeah, that's good. Yeah. That's good. Um, so when talking about buying equipment, um, you know, you have to know the- current replacement cost of that item, uh, mini excavator, skid steer, whatever it is, and then what your expected return on investment of it is. So if you don't know what your return on investment is, you don't know how much revenue you need to make it viable to buy it. So for example, if it's a larger piece of equipment, like a reach forklift or a boom lift, my, my equations would say, well, you need to be able to make a 50 to 60% return on investment to buy a new one, or at least 50%. Whereas if, it, if we're talking about a log splitter or an aerator or a cutoff saw, then it needs to be over 70 or 80% before I'm gonna consider buying a new one. Um, and I think the other caveat to that is you don't buy one if you're not missing rentals or if you can't get into a new market with it. Because one of the, the things that people look at sometimes is wow, this piece of equipment made an amazing amount of money. Let's buy more. But all you're doing is you're splitting that revenue between multiple units. Now, if you never missed a rental, then it doesn't make sense to buy more. So you need to know how much it costs so you can know the expected return on investment to help make that buying decision. You need to know the dates that you missed so you can make sure they're not overlapping. Again, like that log splitter decision. If you missed 20 rentals, but they were all on the same day, one more log splitter is only going to serve one more rental. So you need to know that. And then the contractor type and the term is important because if you're missing, you know, monthly rentals on a 12 inch chipper to multiple landscapers, that's an easy decision really quick to, to buy more. Whereas if it's a day here or there only in peak seasons, maybe not. So I, those are kind of the main things to focus on. Um, of course, there's, there's always some edge cases, but um, can't legislate on the extremes. Yeah. And um what about when to sell equipment? When, like when do rental companies need to know to get out of out of the equipment? And then the second piece here is sure on benchmarks. I know Josh, we've talked a little bit about the data piece here, but if I'm new to the rental industry and this all makes sense conceptually, how do I know what those benchmarks are? Like compared to peers, like what are those numbers? Does that, does that exist? That's something the ARA provides. That's something I should get from my rental software. How should I think about that? Yeah. Um, so I guess that's really kind of two different questions. As far as used equipment sales go, you know, that's, it's still hard. You know, you have to use auction values. You have to use um, physical age of the equipment. You have to use runtime on the equipment because for example, you know, the last couple of years, you might normally sell a piece of equipment at seven years, but if it's been used nonstop and a lot more utilized than normal, and at five years, it's the same usage amount as it'd be at eight or nine years, you might need to sell it sooner. Um, you know, I, I, one of the things that I think is going to be exciting and, you know, I know we talk about AI a lot and most of the time it's far into the future, not anything that we can use, but as we get more data on what's, what's the value of the used equipment, um, what's my equipment spend or repair spend on that piece of equipment, in, including time, what's my replacement cost for that piece of equipment then I think that you're going to start being able to generate it first, maybe some um, recommended analytics, like at least red flag this or green flag this, that you should look at it. But I think over time, some predictive or prescriptive analytics, because, you know, some of those systems could easily learn, you know, this time of year is the best time to sell. Um, and I know the used equipment value isn't where it needs to be right now, but it will go up this time, a chipper in spring will go up. And this one's getting close to the hour reading and it's getting close to the year uh, time frame that we need to sell it. And that's going to hit spring. We don't want to miss spring because then it's going to go down in value. So we're going to go ahead and sell it now rather than later. And so I think we're going to start to get some you know, predictive and maybe even prescriptive analytics on stuff around that. And that's something that I would look for my software company to do. You know, crawl, walk, run. You know, first, let me put in things like used equipment value, replacement value, age, and stuff like that, and make recommendations. And then over time, get 
more and more complicated. Um, and then as far as comparing to peers, you know, I would say uh, peer groups are really valuable for that. We have a partner called Peer Executive Groups that they actually sit down and they compare each other's financials every year in small groups, almost like the board of directors, non-competitive, under non-disclosures. Those are super helpful because then you can get really down into the nitty gritty of like, why is your um, uh, employee cost as a percentage of revenue so much lower than mine? You know, or how are you managing this or that? But overarchingly, you know, we talk about dollar utilization and time utilization. Which of those is more important to you? I think depends on your, your cash position. If you're incredibly well financed or you're a publicly traded company, time utilization is a really good metric. If it's your bank account um, and you don't have an unlimited supply of money, dollar utilization might be more important because you can't necessarily get access to a bunch more capital whenever you need it. Um, and Josh, on so that point, that, not to yeah. put you on the spot, could you just define what how you calculate both of those just for people who may not have heard those terms before? Totally. So dollar utilization is the easier one to define. Dollar, And I can send over how to calculate these metrics to everybody as well because we have a paper on it. But um, dollar utilization is the rental revenues divided by the original equipment cost, not the depreciated value, not the current value. If you bought it used, I wouldn't count the used value, but the original cost new gives you your dollar utilization. So if it's a, in simple terms, if it's a $100,000 item and you make $50,000 a year on it, it's a 50% dollar utilization. Part of what that accounts for too, when you look at your whole fleet, is it makes sure that from a dollar perspective, you're not overweighting certain categories. So for example, larger equipment usually makes a, a lower dollar valuation. Smaller equipment usually makes a higher dollar valuation. If you did it, or dollar utilization, if you did it by units instead of original equipment cost, you might have some stuff like aerators, log splitters, and cutoff saws that make a 300% dollar utilization that completely skew your overall financial dollar utilization. Um, so we look at that both categorically, individual items, and then over your whole fleet, and that weights everything properly. Um, so that's dollar utilization. Uh, time utilization is a little bit more complicated because it's a, um, an equation based on the dollar value of your fleet. How often could that item have been out and how often was it out? And then it does that for your whole fleet. So that's a more complicated metric that you want a computer to calculate or your rental software to calculate for you. But I can give you the formula um, afterwards. It's just, it's more complicated. Yeah, but yeah, essentially it does the same thing for time out versus revenue over a period of time. That's helpful. Thank you, Josh. Um, I want to move to technology, which is a topic we've talked about a lot. something I, I like to talk about. But you know, the topic is thinking about technology, where's the rental industry going next year, five years? We briefly touched on AI. We've talked about dynamic pricing in, in the past. There's probably a lot we can dive into here, but uh, maybe just broadly think about, talk about technology in the rental industry. We've talked, you know, I think uh, Deloitte's ranked the rental industry 47 out of 48 in terms of technology adoption. There's still a long way to go. Um, love to hear your view on technology and how rental companies should be thinking about that. Yeah, um, so that is, that is a huge question. Um, so let me let me address it in two different parts, uh, or maybe even three. We'll start with how technology is affecting the contractor, and then we'll kind of move from there. Um, so technology and complexity of equipment is increasing. Um, that is both a, a difficulty for equipment rental companies, but it's more of a difficulty for contractors. If you think about, you know, almost 15 years ago now, pre-tier four, if you grew up on a farm working on a truck or a tractor and you're out on a job site because you're a lumber contractor, a plumber now, and you have something go wrong on a diesel piece of equipment, you can probably look at it, might be able to diagnose it, might be able to even fix it. You know, now you can't change a spark plug without a computer. That makes it really hard for contractors to repair stuff and own stuff because not just everybody can work on it in the same way. So I see that as a benefit, another tailwind, the equipment rental industry. Electrification is similar. It's adding cost, upfront cost that's significant and complexity uh, to the piece of equipment. I personally like electrification for rental companies for simplicity and maintenance. You know, when you look at electric cars, for the most part, they take less maintenance. Um, now, when they need maintenance, it may be more expensive, but they take less maintenance. And what is one of the hardest positions for you to fill right now? 
mechanic. Right. And so if you have less mechanic time spent on a piece of equipment, that means more utilization for you, more uptime and the mechanic can spend time on things that that need to be repaired or serviced rather than doing a bunch of preventative maintenance, which doesn't really add dollar value to equipment. I also find that for um, smaller pieces of equipment, it's simpler. You know, I don't know how many of you have ever watched a novice try and start a uh, pulse chainsaw. But it's terrifying. You know, I don't understand how we've never had a customer cut, not cut off their leg. Luckily, we haven't. Um, but an electric chainsaw, it just works or it doesn't work, you know, and the battery technology has improved enough over the years and is continuing to improve that I'm not sure I'd go out there and buy all of it tomorrow. But I think we're in a place where you can start adopting that when, it, when some of our vendors and I won't name names can say we're going all electric and small equipment. That's all we're going to sell because it's all they sell in Europe and in other countries. We're to a place where that, that equipment is probably re reliable enough and, and runtime is long enough that it's time to start adopting those types of equipment. Um, you know, so I think you've got that on one side. You know, I'll get on my soapbox uh, really quickly that you and I have talked about a number of times around dynamic pricing. You know, it, at some point, we've got to help drive consumer behavior. And I'm not going to talk about pricing or whether we should raise or lower or what the price is, as much as to say, going back to that, that log splitter example, on the first cold weekend in Georgia, when every log splitter in Georgia goes out, the price should be different. It should drive consumer behavior to be different. Now, some of us I know try and be creative and we'll do things like right before it gets cold, we'll do a discount or an email about log splitters. Or when customers are calling on that weekend, we'll say, hey, it's you know we're doing a discount for next week during the week or try and reserve it for a future weekend. There's a lot of work there. I think the DIY consumer, not necessarily the contractor, but I think the DIY consumer is either ready or close to ready for how the experience goes in every other part of their life. When they book a hotel, when they book an Airbnb, when they book an Uber, or when they book a flight, they can look at a calendar in some fashion and say, okay, well, I can get that log splitter today for $200 for the weekend. But on Tuesday in the afternoon, it's $50. Why don't I do it on Tuesday in the afternoon for $50? Not that we're trying to gouge the customer as much as drive demand to be more effective and more efficient. And now you've taken that one log splitter and instead of only renting it once for maybe $150 or whatever you rent that for, again, made up prices, um, you're running it more often because the consumer can make more educated behaviors that positively impact your fleet. So I think that's a win-win for both the customer and the rental company because they're going to get higher utilization, probably higher revenue. And the consumer who wants the discount price can found, find that and the consumer just wants to do it when they want to do it. They can get that too. Um, and, and it represents how their behavior works in other areas. Um, and I think, so I think as we've that, talked about, the, the dynamic pricing doesn't just mean surge pricing. It means flexing prices up and down to ultimately increase utilization, which is good for everyone. It's good for the rental company. It's good for the environment because we're getting more utilization around a uh, fixed amount of equipment. It's good for the customer because some customers who are price sensitive allows them and have flexibility to, to rent when it's convenient and lower for them. It's like a, you know the matinee movie price is a simple example, but airlines, hotels, Uber, consumers are used to that. I do think it's a matter of time when that happens to the rental industry. We've, yep. we've, we've talked to groups who are experimenting with that um, as well. I'm curious other other technology trends, particularly, you know, we, we could talk about AI in like 10 years from now, but um, sure. I, I'd be interested in like tactically, like, you know, in the next year, um, low hanging fruit for for rental groups to take advantage of things that no brainers that they should they should jump on right now. You know, I, I think that um, digital advertising has been around for a while, but I think that's incredibly important. Um, if you're not doing it, you should be doing it. Social advertising as well. But digital advertising like Google search terms and stuff like that, when somebody types in rent an excavator near me, they probably need to rent an excavator in the next 24 to 48 hours. It's a no brainer to pay for search terms like that. Um, it's not like the car industry or the you know electronics industry where you just want to go to Best Buy and see what the new TVs are. Nobody's just shopping in rental. So I would be doing a ton of digital advertising. The other thing to keep in mind, you know, in in a lot of industries, you talk about customer acquisition cost or CAC. Um, when you look at how much that keyword costs and how much that first rental costs, that isn't that may be the customer acquisition cost, but that's not the true value of the customer over their lifetime or customer lifetime value. 
when that first person rents from you, if you create a good relationship with them, if you um, build a rapport and they come back to you again, which they probably will, there's a much longer runway on that. The average DIY rents one to two times per year. The average contractor rents multiple times per year. So maybe you paid for that, that first rental a little bit, but after that, the return on investment is amazing. So I would definitely be do, doing digital advertising and investing more in it if you're not already. Long tail keywords, you know, stuff we could do probably a whole nother um, hour or two on. But find, find some folks who are competent at that and know what they're doing, especially it's important that they understand the equipment rental industry because our keywords are different, how they use them, how they localize them, that kind of stuff. So I think that's important. Um, and then secondarily to that, if they land on a website that looks like it was made in the 1980s, that's not going to be a great experience either. You're not just competing with your rental store down the street. You know, you're competing with um, large rental companies, but you're also competing with just consumer trust. When they go to the website of something else in their realm to shop at a, a Best Buy or an Amazon or something like that, you don't necessarily have to give them the Amazon experience but they expect a certain quality or I think you lose some trust with the consumer. Um, and so we want, one of the things that, that we're tracking with our contractors is how they see the world of digital as far as rental goes. And rental's always been a handshake business. I am not at all saying that the handshake isn't still incredibly important and our surveys say that it is. But once you have established the relationship, a lot of contractors over the last few years have realized, particularly in 2020, mm -hmm. that when they're laying in bed at 10 o'clock at night and they realize they need a cutoff saw for the job site for tomorrow morning, they don't want to be texting or calling their sales rep or waiting till 7.30 in the morning to call the rental store to see if it's there. They want to be able to pop up online and go ahead and reserve one of those to pick up in the morning. Or if they need to find the spec out on something because a customer called and had a question that they need to then go check on a job site, pull it up on their phone and see what the specifications of that unit are. So some examples of that from some research on contractors, and these are not contractors who particularly rent or buy, but just an average contractor. 53% um, of them in the last year are wanting to find equipment to rent online. 40% want to schedule delivery and pickup online. 42% want online quotes. 36% um, want, want to pay online invoices. Um, and 29% uh, want to see their order status uh, online. I mean, a huge percentage of these contractors are wanting to do more and more online. And so I think you need to be there. The other thing that we're seeing is that we're seeing a slow decrease in visiting rental stores for how somebody figures out what their next rental is going to be or what they need to rent and a steady increase of internet search, uh, social, um, and visiting rental store websites as a place to do that initial research. Yeah, that's awesome data. That's that's actually much higher on contractors than what I thought. I mean, we, the homeowner data makes sense because people order Dunkin' Donuts on their phone and everything on their phone or online, right? That's what they expect. Contractors is always lagged behind that. And it's interesting. You're, what you're saying is about half of contractors want to be able to shop, engage online. And in, in what you were saying earlier, does it seem like the start of the relationship is still done with the handshake face-to-face, -face, but it's the repeat rentals after that that are done digitally? Is that sort of the trend you're seeing? That's right. Once you have the relationship, then they want ease of access to information, data, their data, what's going on. You know, you can order a burger on Uber Eats and track it on its way to you. But if you order a $100,000 piece of equipment, you have no idea where it is. You know, so they're wanting some of that same experience um, with the relationship on top of that. Um, and if, if you don't mind, I want to pivot really quickly because yeah. Ziad, uh, I hope I didn't butcher your name, I apologize, asked a question or, or made a statement. Yeah. What are the most important factors? And it actually reminded me of a huge mistake that we made um, that I'm glad that, that he brought that up. So uh, what makes a rental store successful? Is it location, price, equipment quality, pricing, and variety? And so the answer to that is yes. <laughs> it's all of those things, obviously, but it's it's doing it for how your company is designed, what makes you best. Not every company wants to be the cheapest company, and that doesn't make sense. You know, you can't have all of those at once. But one of the mistakes that we made and when we had to close that one location is we had decided we were going to try and compete like a larger company without having the balance sheet of a larger company. And so we bought a really nice big location 
um, off the beaten path. I mean, it was kind of on an interstate, so it was a good location that way, but it wasn't a place that people drove by. Um, and we had an outside sales force. So we had people knocking on job site doors and all that kind of stuff, but not to the level of some of our larger competitors. Um, cause we focus on a small and mid-sized contractor. We completely devalued the importance of being on a main road where people are driving by you because landscapers, which were a big part of uh, many of our locations, businesses, you're not finding on a job site. DIY, you're not finding on a job site. Some small contractors are really hard to find and, and you only find over a long period of time unless they're on a job site. So while we did some good digital advertising, although that was, you know, before that was huge, um, it, not having that drive-by location was a huge mistake. So, you know, following the model, when we then opened another location in the future, we made sure it was in a drive-by location and were able to pick up revenue for our customer type so much faster. Um, so location is incredibly important based on how your, your company's designed. Yeah. And just to double click into this, like, I think you made a good point. You can't compete with the nationals without their balance sheet, like in a certain way. Like, so you have to pick your spots. I think more, more specifically, if you're a small rental company growing fast, but bootstrapped and you, you know, don't have the balance sheet of United Rentals, like how, how do you win if, if you're that company? Because you can't spend on a huge location and digital ads and every equipment in the world, right? You got to place your bets. Is it customer service? Like where are the, where are the points that the smaller companies can really focus on and, and win? I think a lot of that depends on your location, where you're at and the design of your business. So if you're, you know, small tool and DIY focused, that's very different. But I, I think the, I think the best example that I can give um, would be when we opened a new location um, south of Atlanta that was in a town where almost everything was based on a gigantic plant that had opened up there. And there were already two rental companies there. They were both large national rental companies. And one of the things they struggled with is their main focus, I, I would say for their sales reps, was to get that account and then own that account. You know, They wanted that giant account and the rest of the stuff that was around there was much, much smaller. Um, so when the sales rep who owned that account would run out of equipment, what do they do? They can't refer them to their competitor. They don't really want to tell their customer no. So they were always stuck in kind of a hard place. So when we moved into that town and opened a location, both of those large rental companies actually took our sales rep to meet all of their customers because we weren't competing for those same type of customers that we were, or that they were. We were a safe space for them. We, we were never going to get that, that manufacturing account. And we didn't want that manufacturing account. We wanted the small contractors or these to be a secondary supplier for a company like Scanskin, not to be the main supplier. And so um, I think it's, it's learning where you can be special and different and then really focusing and honing on that and, and making sure that you repeat that and not get away from that. I see so many companies who just try and become a, a large rental company or national rental company doing the exact same things that they do. And I'm not sure, I'm not saying that there aren't success stories of that, especially in certain markets or with certain relationships or experience, but for the most part that you, you've got to find something that's different in your market than what other people do and do that thing really well. So not doing everything well, pick the one thing that's the difference maker and do that well. Yeah. Sounds like it. Josh, we just have a couple minutes left. Um, I want to wrap up with a couple more questions. Maybe you can answer. I'm going to also post in the chat here a link to the next rental roundtable. It'll be July 19th with uh, John Adcock. We're excited about him. You can see the information we're going to cover with him, but wanted to get that invite out to people who want to sign up to the next one. But Josh, in the last uh, couple minutes here, we've got two questions which sort of relate to each other. One is, how do we increase sales on rental equipment? Secondly, Curious as the, the best way to gain new customers in a small, heavy equipment rental company today. Is it cold calling, email campaigns, discounted advertising? Really, the question is, if you're a smaller rental company, how do you grow? Um, so I, I guess that, that could be two really different questions. So how do we enhance sales on rental equipment? Um, I'm assuming they need, mean rental sales, um, not new or used equipment sales, because that's a completely different conversation. Um, but if you're talking about rental sales, uh, and I'll try and, uh, well, I'll, I'll post a, my LinkedIn on here afterwards, and there's an article on there that I wrote on how to increase your inside sales program. But really simply, it's about finding ways to, to easily build relationships. And one of the most common examples that I would give is most rental companies don't have an inside sales plan. 
Um, and you can start off incredibly simply, pick a threshold, let's say $500, and have your inside people when it's slow on a Wednesday midday, call everybody who spent more than $500 with you last week, thank them for their business and see if there's anything that you can do to help them with. I mean, that's, that's, it's not a cold call. It's not a hard call. It's just a follow-up call. Call your top 100 customers once a quarter and thank them for your business. Have the managers of the branches who aren't the salespeople reach out to every new account and say, hey, I know you normally work with our sales rep or our inside sales team, but I'm the branch manager here. If you ever need anything special, I'm here to support you. There are a number of really simple, easy, non-cold calls that almost anybody could do that can really enhance your business, create those relationships um, and, and grow your revenues. Um, so that was that was one of those. And then are we out of time for me to answer the other one or do you want me to try, try and answer the other one? Yeah, let's just go two more minutes over. Um, yeah. Are you talking about the Colorado question? Um, I, let, let's see, there was Sean who said, uh, cold calling email campaign discounted advertise. Okay, so I think I kind of answered that one, uh, Sean. We can uh, we can definitely dive deeper into that at some point. And then Colorado real estate is out of control, which makes location very difficult. Sorry, our own company is to the title equipment. Can a delivery only system work with the exception? Uh, with I guess with an exceptional marketing budget. So like budget. no brick and mortar location. Can I can I start a rental business that way and grow it online? I mean. I'd like most of the other questions, I guess the answer is yes, <laughs> but um, you know you, you can't you can't just do that. You've got to be in the right market. You've got to understand the customers you're going after. You got to have a way to be able to contact and get in touch with those customers. You know, I've seen. I would have said prior to 2020, if you don't have a million dollars in fleet, you're not really showing up as a rental company when you're getting started. Um, you know, or or trying to grow to that. It's a very expensive business to get into, yet. Post that, I've seen some folks be really incredibly targeted with their marketing and just have a skid steering mini excavator and get started and grow from there. Um, so I was proven wrong. And, and I would say it is possible, but it's not necessarily easy. And you can't go after your traditional contractor. If you've just got a mini excavator and a skid steer, they need a jumping jack tamp and a cutoff saw and a 60 pound electric breaker and all these other things. And if you don't have those, why are they going to keep coming to you to rent that? instead of going to somebody who has a full fleet. But on the flip side, if you're going after, let's say production rental across the street and your best friend is one of the lead transportation people who make the rental decisions and they're frustrated with their current rental company, they have five items that they rent most of the time and they're willing to give you some time to build your fleet, it's a completely different conversation. So I think the answer is yes, but you really have to think that through so that you can get through to those customers and build a business around it, not just hope that if I throw enough marketing dollars to them, they'll come. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, Josh, I think we're out of time here. Uh, it's been awesome. We've got a lot of questions from folks. Um, I'll just wrap up. Again, the link for the next session will be in the in the chat here. Also, LinkedIn, Josh is LinkedIn. If you want to reach out to him directly, um, Josh Nickel on LinkedIn. He's obviously loves talking to members, love, love talking rental, um, and we're happy to, to chat anytime. So Josh, really appreciate you having on having you on. I think honestly, let's talk again next summer. I'd love to talk about the five trends we're seeing then because I think things are happening, things are changing. And it, we're both optimists. I think we like what we're seeing, but um I really appreciate you coming on and um thanks for the time, Josh. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on.